Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Klaus Weber. I'm the Deputy Director of the Northwestern Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. Uh, and I welcome you all back to our webinar series um, called Building Sustainable Futures, Global Challenges and Possibilities. Um, and as part of that series, uh, we consider different United Nations Sustainable Development Goals each year. And in the spring quarter, uh, we're looking at uh, the SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities. And what we really want to do is sort of look behind the scenes of uh, reduced inequalities, um, asking where do they come from, look at historical and present structures that produce inequalities in our own country and across the world, um, and specifically look at the global connectedness of these inequalities and injustices um, and seek visions for creating a more unjust and uh, future. Uh, the series is co-sponsored by the Northwestern University Community for Human Rights. Today's session uh, focuses on narco-trafficking, state-making and inequality, uh, where the global connectedness of violence and injustice uh, arises not only from the flow of goods, the drugs and the money, uh, but also from the actions of states and in fact from the very foundation of state making uh, at the local and uh, international level. And so we really focus on the connection between Latin and North America in this regards. Um, we have two real experts um, uh, for this conversation. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome both of you. Uh, Lena Brito is an associate professor of history at Northwestern um, and uh, has focused uh, primarily on Colombia as a context uh, in which to interrogate those things. Uh, Don Marie Paley is a journalist and author of Drug War Capitalism, um, whose research has focused on Mexico. Um, and so we're very excited to have you both here um, and look forward to a conversation. So the session format is that um, the, the two of them will, will engage in a a conversation that brings to the four different issues and commonalities. Um, and then we invite we invite some, everyone in the audience to submit questions and we'll broaden it out some and have a, have a broader discussion. Uh, so super excited about this um, uh, session today and I'll turn it over to the two of you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Klaus, Deputy Director, also Annalise Riles, uh, the Director of the Buffett Institute, and a special thanks to Ariel, Ahmed, uh, Dylan, everybody in the Buffett Institute who uh, help us deal with the logistics uh, and to make this possible. So, unfortunately, the topic of our conversation today is one of the main factors why both Mexico and Colombia are two of the most dangerous countries in the Americas right now, in kind of like a permanent state of low intensity warfare. Well, in fact, in my country right now, there's no low intensity in what's happening right now as we speak. Since late Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday, uh, April 28th, when labor unions and social organizations call for a national strike to protest against a tax reform that the president of Colombia, Ivan Duque, intended to pass in Congress to resolve a fiscal deficit produced by his own mismanagement of the pandemic, a militarized police force and the army have engaged in practices that can only be called state terrorism. So just like in the all good days of the Cold War, when military dictatorships massacre their people on the streets and the whole world watch, that's exactly what's happening right now in Colombia. So the reason why I'm bringing this up, uh, and we can talk about that later if any one of you is interested in talking about the human rights violations and get more like data and information about what's going on. Uh, I have some uh, numbers and, 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 and documented um, data um, to explain better about what's going on. Um, but the point that I want to make is actually um, two points. The first one is that the only reason why Colombia has one of the most expensive and aggressive armed forces and law enforcement agencies in the Americas is because of four decades of drug wars have allowed the technological, logistical, and ideological overhaul of the repressive state apparatus. And the second point that I wanna make with this comment is because, let's use the words of the New York Times because it put it really well, when they were reporting about these protests and they said that what initially was a protest against this regressive tax reform morph into, quote, and these are the New York Times uh, words, a national outcry over rising poverty, unemployment, and inequality. 
So as you can see, what's going on right now has everything to do with our topic of conversation. So let's talk about narco-trafficking, state-making, and inequality. And the way in which we are going to do it is in a conversation. Instead of presenting uh, about it, we're just going to engage in a dialogue first, the two of us, and then with all of you. So, Dom, thank you so much for accepting this invitation and for being here with us from Puebla, Mexico, uh, which is where you live. So the first question um, is actually for you. Um, so you're not just a journalist, you also are a sociologist, you have a PhD in sociology, and your first book, Drug War Capitalism, is the result of that research uh, for your uh, PhD. So in that book, which is absolutely fantastic and I recommend to everybody, uh, you make the case that the drug war has been used against the population at large in cities and rural areas to facilitate policy changes that benefit international private sector and also deepen socioeconomic and political inequalities. So can you please walk us kind of like through the main ideas of, of your book um, and also how your perspective uh, is different to other uh, explanations out there? Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena, for this invitation to Klaus for the introduction and to Ariel and, and the Buffett Institute for all of your help with the technical side of things. Um, I'm going to start with the second part of your question, Lina. So I think the official version uh, of what's taking place in Colombia and Mexico in terms of uh, the war on drugs is very close to the Netflix version. Uh, it's you know an official discourse which tells us that uh, good governments with the occasional corrupt officer or the occasional bad apple, uh, military, police, etc., um, is fighting the bad guys uh, who are the drug cartels. It's you know the the Netflix version is 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 a Hollywood eyes better looking people probably, um, but description of how the state of Mexico, the state of Colombia, and the United States as a sort of purveyor. Uh, of this discourse wishes to present what's taking place in these countries. Um, what I tried to do is drug war capitalism, which I actually reported as a journalist um, before I started my PhD, um, is I, I, I basically started from the ground up. So the way you know we work as journalists is going into communities and speaking with people who've been directly impacted. So directly impacted by violence connected to the drug war, be it uh, violence from states or violence from paramilitary groups, and those conversations over many years led me to understand that the way that official discourse is working and what we're being told about this violence is very different from the way it plays out on the ground from the way that people uh, live through it. So I would definitely say that the sort of Netflix version, um, it's, it's very consumable. It's a very complete explanation of what's going on, um, but I would not call it neutral. I would not call it accurate and I would not call it fact based. And I think that's the work that journalists are doing and academics are doing um, is trying to get at what is actually happening, right? Um, so, what drug war capitalism looks at in a nutshell, and of course, trying to sum up a book in five minutes is an impossible task, but um, basically it starts with Plan Colombia, uh, which was a US Colombia joint plan, multi billion dollar plan, supposedly to uh, stop the flow of cocaine to the United States primarily. Um, and then it also looks at the Merida initiative, which is basically a very similar type of policy also coming into the billions of dollars of financing from Washington. Uh, again, to supposedly stop the flow of cocaine and the flow of heroin, uh, the production and flow of heroin from Mexico to the United States. So it's all about reducing the supply in the United States, according to the official discourse, according to the official story that we're told. Um, but what we see on the ground is generally I talk about it in kind of three ways. These plans, Plan Colombia and the Merida Initiative, which like I mentioned, the, the Merida Initiative started in 2008. Uh, Plan Colombia started in 2000. Um, they actually work in different ways that are not often talked about. One is through changing policies. So there's all kinds of transformations in regulation, in promoting uh, free markets and promoting competition, in creating the conditions in the case of Colombia for the Colombia US free trade agreement. All of these things were done in the context of Plan Colombia, often with direct US money under a discourse that through less regulation, through more economic competition, you can reduce 
uh, the possibility of having a war on drugs. You can reduce poverty, which we now know, and I think a lot of people at the time fought very hard against that idea is false. Because these policies of austerity, um, shrinking the state in social services uh, have actually deepened inequality, which is obviously one of the big factors that we're talking about today. You also have the sort of policing aspect. So these are programs that militarize prohibition. Um, I always feel like it's worthwhile to clarify that prohibition is not a hands-off policy. It's not the state saying, I don't know, the criminals are moving the drugs. I guess we'll just know. It's a highly proactive uh, military uh, uh, military strategy, series of military strategies to intercept and criminalize uh, the movement of these chemicals, uh, of these stimulants, et cetera which could be much better managed through regulation or through legalization. But so it's a very hands-on process and we see it here in Mexico, primarily through the, the federal police, now through the National Guard and through the army, which has deployed since 2006 throughout Mexico on this pretext of fighting the war on drugs, where the enemies in this war are the Mexican people. So it's a war on the people. Um, and then the third piece is paramilitarism. Um, and paramilitarism is a known outcome of militarizing prohibition. It happened in Colombia and it's happening in Mexico. Um, for people who don't follow these debates or aren't aware, paramilitarism is an important frame because what it, it tells us is that these armed groups that are presented in the, net, in the Netflix version, the official version that are presented as fighting the state for control of territory, for control of of, of criminal enterprises are in fact working with state forces. And that's something that we see over and over again, right? So so-called cartels uh, actually having very close relationships with the army or with police or having you know, the arrest of, of General Cienfuegos or Garcia Luna, the, the ex head of the federal police who is still in prison in the United States is important in terms of understanding that it is the state organizing the militarization of prohibition that is creating these paramilitary groups, these cartels who are in fact working in many, in many moments in many different ways for, for these states and, and very closely with security forces. And all of these conditions together, I argue in drug war capitalism, create an environment that is actually quite friendly uh, to capitalism, to major transnational corporations, extractive projects, et cetera. So, you know, hard to sum it up in such a short time, um, but, we, have, we see similar things as well in Central America. So I also write about Honduras and Guatemala. And I think we're still, you know, the, the exodus, the massive crisis of people leaving Central America is also directly connected to these violences, which are um, often born and funded um, from Mexico. So now it's your turn, Lena. I get to turn the tables. Um, I've actually just recently read your book. Well, it's a new book, came out last year, uh, Marijuana Boom. And in that book, you look specifically at the origins of drug trafficking in Colombia. I think this is super useful because I start in 2000 and you go way back and you kind of, you know, excavate some of that history. And in fact, a lot of what you do in that book is history that has not been told, uh, at least not for an, an English uh, audience. So I'm wondering if you can talk us about, talk us through that emergence of the drug trafficking business in Colombia um, and how we can maybe start thinking about the emergence of this trade in other places in Latin America. And just, yeah, I know it's not enough time, of course, but if you can just kind of tell us what your most important findings are and how you think they might be applicable in other geographies. Yeah, in many ways, uh, my, my work um, um, relates very well with what you just said about your own work. So my book is about the very first uh, economy of illegal drugs in Colombia, which happened in the northernmost section of the Colombian Caribbean coast in the 1970s and revolve around marijuana, not cocaine, right? So in trying to understand how that happened in that region, um, I, I, I arrived to two conclusions that I think can also help us to understand other cases in Latin America. So the first one has to do with why 
these drug economies and cultures emerge in certain areas in certain countries and not in others. And the explanation so far has been poverty and the absence of the state, right? We see that uh, case after case in different parts of Colombia, in different areas of Mexico, in Peru, in Bolivia, and all the countries in Latin America that are uh, drug producing countries, we have the same uh, explanation is poverty and is the absence of the states. There are no law, no state, uh, there's nothing here. That's why illegality uh, lay roots and grows and thrives, right? And in my own work, in this particular case of Colombia, I found that it's exactly the opposite. So I'm not arguing that the state and the state institutions and the central government were strong in the region. No, they were very weak. But we cannot find the come the causes for the emergence of the marijuana economy, which is the case that I examine um, uh, specifically in that myth of the absence of the state. You know, that term, the myth of the absence of the state is, uh, is actually the, the work of a uh, Colombian anthropologist, Margarita Serge, for those of you who are out there and wants to explore more the idea. So that myth of the absence of the state cannot explain this. And what I did instead was, okay, so what, what explains this uh, situation, right? And what I found is that during many decades, since the early 20th century up until the boom in the 1970s, the Colombian governments in association with US governments and multilateral institutions carry out a series of reforms in pursuit of agrarian development and nation state formation that included educational reform, um, a series of works of infrastructure an agrarian reform um, and all these modernizing reforms uh, which again were implemented with the support of US federal agencies and governments, private investors and multilateral institutions. Um, what they did was instead of promoting a democratic access to financial, technological, and natural resources for all, they created a system of privileges in which only those who were well connected, especially to the political parties at the time, could thrive. So the result is that small producers and farmers were cornered to the fringes of the region and marginalized. So it is in those uh, uh, in in the way in which those who were cornered and marginalized accommodate to respond to these state reforms that we find the conditions for the emergence of this illegal drugs economy. And the other finding that I think is helpful to understand other cases, not just Colombia, has to do with the use of violence in the drug trade business. So common sense says that this business, because it's illegal, is violent in, its, is violent in itself, it's intrinsically violent. But I found that for many years, this economy and culture operated in relatively peaceful ways. It's not that there was no violence, but there were mechanisms of mediation to keep that violence in check. And what happened is that when this, the, this marijuana region becomes the epicenter of the first war on drugs in Colombia, you know, the second one in the Americas after Mexico, which was the very first laboratory, right? This region becomes kind of like a laboratory of experimentation for the US and Colombian governments to try a different approach to statecraft and international cooperation. And the premise was that drug production and trafficking were national security threats that warranted military interventions. So is the criminalization of producers and the militarization of the region, the violence of the state, what prompts violent responses on the part of the producers and traffickers. So those mechanisms that they have to keep violence in check were not helpful and useful anymore. So we see that vicious circle in which we still are today. Um, so I think kind of like those two aspects um, uh, are really uh, helpful to understand other cases in the Americas as well, Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, especially. Yeah, so let's talk sure. about um, our methodologies, right? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I like very much about your, your work is that um, as a journalist, uh, you made the leap toward theory and social science, right? Um, 
And usually journalists and scholars, we don't talk to each other. We scholars use journalists work when we need them as sources uh, for our own projects. Um, so I was just very impressed with how you do like rigorous, judicious, journalistic research. And at the same time, you engage with the scholarship and you also produce theory and new knowledge uh, from like the social sciences point of view. So what were kind of like the ethical concerns or methodological challenges that prompted you to do something like that? Sure, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I mean, it's very clear, for example, here in Mexico, where you have journalism being one of the most dangerous, scary uh, occupations uh, that there is. Um, and most academia, which is studying violence today in Mexico, is relying extremely heavily on journalists to actually be in the field, to be doing the interviews, to be collecting the information at very little risk to themselves and with much greater stability economically, career-wise in terms of, you know, benefits and everything. So there's, that is a huge inequality. I mean, one of the things I think that's complicated about journalism is it's not, it, there's no class unity. There's, there's extremely well-paid journalists and there's journalists making a minimum wage salary. So it's very hard to talk about it as an even thing, um, but certainly in my own experience, uh, I've stepped towards academia at moments for the simple practical reason of, for example, being able to do a PhD program with some funding over a four year period, which is something that I simply have not ever had. You don't have that as a freelancer. You don't get to have that kind of security that lets you do a longer project. You're always kind of worrying about what's coming next. Um, I think one of the limitations of, I mean, it's a very exciting place and you've been there. I mean, you're also a journalist, have worked as a journalist and now as an academic. It's an exciting place to be in, in between, in between conversations and be, you know, sort of um, nutriendo, like feeding uh, one with the other. Um, I think one of, one of the, I remember one of the reflections I had when I was writing Drug War Capitalism, I did a master's in journalism, so I really didn't have much experience, like in a sort of postgraduate setting with, a ton of theory was that I just remember having this thought at one point. I, you know, the, the saying, like, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, like, does it really fall? And my question was, like, if I write an article about the violence in Mexico, about the war in Mexico, and I don't talk about drug cartels, I don't use the word drug cartels, I don't use the word setas, I don't use the word cartel de Sinaloa, am I still writing about the war in Mexico? And at that time, it felt like I wasn't it f like no editor, no newspaper, no magazine would be interested 10 years ago. Uh, I started re researching drug war capitalism in 2010 in considering thinking about the war in, in Mexico as something that wasn't primarily about evil groups of greedy men fighting each other for briefcases full of money. Um, I do feel like we've come a long way since then. Um, especially because of journalists, independent journalists doing that on the ground reporting, but also because of the, of the emergence of extremely powerful social movements in Mexico, um, repudiating the violence, for example, the, the disappearance of the 43 students in Ayotzinapa, which caused a national outrage. You could feel the rage in the streets for months. People were very mobilized around that. Um, but also the, the collectives of family members, of people who've been murdered, mostly people who've been disappeared, led by mothers. There's now more than 120 of these collectives in Mexico who are pushing to change the discourse. Because the thing with journalism is we're, we're trapped within kind of a discourse. So it was like, I felt like as a journalist, I just kept hitting this wall where it was like the cartels, the cartels, the cartels. It's the only acceptable way to talk about that. So going back into some history, um, going back and looking at what had taken place in Colombia, what was taking place in Colombia, how academics in Colombia had thought about it. You know, when I, I remember when I realized that we, I would just assume that people always knew that they were paramilitary groups in Colombia. And I realized that it was a struggle. It was a struggle by Colombian activists to have that term normalized, um, to have that term used and recognized by the government because it indicates the direct complicity of the government, of state forces, right? So realizing we need to change the discourse, we need to stop criminalizing the victims of this violence, 
we need to stop making assumptions about who's good and who's evil and what the roots of this conflict are based on what the government and especially the police are telling us. So it's really that desire to move towards changing kind of the discourse, the way we're even talking about it kind of forced me into theory and in, into thinking of, of, about a longer project, a book length project and eventually into doing a PhD. So that's kind of a, a short um, overview. Um, and I actually loved that as well. Like in your work, I felt your journalist history as well, like just in how readable it was, um, how you use different methodologies, including, you know, the methodology of journalism. Our basically our whole methodology is doing interviews with people. Like there's very little else. I mean, there are data journalists and so on, but it's just going and talking to people, right? And listening actually more than talking. And I found like in your book, you really powerfully wove that listening that you were able to do um, as well with your own life experiences, even just your own um, reflections on how your perception of this region changed from even thinking of it as being so uh, tropical and exotic compared to, you know, where you grew up in Medellin. And I'm so wondering, I'm like, I'm curious if you can bring us there, if you can talk about how you avoided that exoticization and that sort of pop culture fetishization of of the marijuana, the drug boom um, in this region of Colombia. If you could tell us more about your own process here, how you approach that history um, to avoid perpetuating stereotypes, because that's the thing, these stereotypes are deadly. These stereotypes end people's lives. They end with people being in prison and how your scholarship actually pushes to change that, to, 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 to change that status quo. Yeah. Um... So it was actually um, a Mexican um, scholar, a drug historian, right? A drug historian is the historians uh, like me that we specialize in studying the history of drug production, commerce, and consumption. So Luisa Storga is one of the most important uh, drug historians in Mexico, and he has uh, many books. And one of them, he talks about the, the, the mythology or the myth of the narcotrafficker and narcotrafficking. So again, all how how our understanding of what's going on in this illegal economy and culture is so paid by half truths and by myths. And he talked about that very explicitly to explain how common sense knowledge uh, about the drug business and culture is framed by mass media and the interest behind mass media by literature music pop culture in general is a mediated knowledge right um because rarely the people who are participants in in in, in affected witnesses survivors etc of these rarely had the time to talk speak for themselves so i i kind of like took that warning very seriously. And I realized very early on in my own research that I share that exotic view, that mythology about the marijuana economy of the 1970s. And I knew it because my own family, my father and my father's family are from this region. And I have relatives that were involved in this economy when there was a boom, either uh, in transportation uh, or even cultivation. So I was forced by my own uh, identity, my own family, kind of like to to make the effort to see the whole thing from within. And the way in which I, I started to see things from within was, first of all, to recognize my own bias and my own uh, exoticizing perspective. Second, practicing active listening, or also sometimes calling journalism and ethnography and psychotherapy, uh, deep listening, which is putting yourself in the other person's shoes and really trying to see his or her perspective to understand motivations and intentions regardless of outcomes. So an example, I remember doing the first interviews with people who cultivated uh, or, or commercialized marijuana in the 70s and asking them about marijuana. And they always go back to talk about coffee and the smuggling of coffee. And I'm like, I don't understand why these people are talking about this, why they don't answer my question. So I started practicing active listening, deep listening, and I realized the reason is because the, the smuggling of coffee and marijuana were completely intertwined. And the marijuana smuggling business actually emerged because there was a structure, a social, economic, financial structure for the smuggling of coffee. So, but I really needed to listen to them because uh, 
to me initially they were just avoiding my answer my question and answering whatever they wanted to um and then i think the other practice that helped me a lot besides listening was allowing room for contingency and for chance many of my research decisions were the result of, of fortuitous encounters things that i did not plan that i did not have any control over so i really let like you know chance to guide me and the tools that i used to kind of like keep my balance in that in that you know um letting myself be driven by chance was to use uh, the training that I have in journalism, in ethnography, and in history. So the limitations of one discipline, I compensated them with the strengths of the other. So I think in their interdisciplinary work, like really helped a lot. Um, so I, all, I know that um, we want to uh, leave at least half an hour for conversation with the audience. And we also have uh, one more question for each other, but maybe we'll be able to uh, talk about that last topic that we wanted to talk uh, as a response to um, somebody's question or comment. So Klaus, I think um, uh, we just probably go to the audience right now and see what kinds of comments and questions people have and see if sure. we can address that last topic that we have prepared um, in conversation with the people with the audience yes. and uh, my my bet is that um, the, the question will will the questions will lead you right there so um, I'm like I'm like sure to give you time if, if you feel you haven't covered it um, so maybe one um, sort of broad question or prompt to to get us started um, is to uh, I think what for both of you very nicely uh, conveyed is is the the systemic nature of of the issue here where it's not you cannot just tell that linear story there's you know there's bad guys here and then everything else follows from that and that that it's um it's very interwoven um and i think that's that's a powerful insight um that that this is a a systemic sort of uh, process um it, it also does raise a little bit of of a question about um the heterogeneity within the different participants so you know the, the the state as a as an actor um the private interest as an actor the cartels as an actor um and so what i'd like you to talk about a little bit is about the the unity heterogeneity disagreements um on between many different factions and what is really the systemic aspect that brings all of this together to produce the, the negative outcomes that you have, even though there's a lot of different actors having different interests and, and also different ambitions? Um, so I know it's a very broad question, but I, I hope it gives you a prompt to, to sort of uh, dive a little deeper into the, the mechanics and, and, and where you see the, the, the problem arises. Would you like to go first, Lena, or should I? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so drug war capitalism is, I mean, it's too big. Definitely, uh, if I was pitching that as a thesis project, my advisor would say no, four countries, like two, gener two decades, like too much. Um, and so what I what I did after drug war capitalism, because I kind of think of, of the work of, of, of that book, Drug War Capitalism, as being an attempt to open a new conversation and that's the thing that's how I think about it so not as a sort of a be all end all this is the explanation but rather how can we thinking about this together in a way that's more productive that can help us actually in a fertile manner come up with you know a better discussion and, a, and, and an end to this violence and what what I realized is that in order to do the second part which is what I did more in my dissertation which is the how so if drug war capitalism is the why the how you have to go to a single region um, and you have to work over a specific time period. In, in the specificity of Mexico, I worked in one part of a metropolitan region because you have different actors ranging, as you said, right? So you have different, uh, different paramilitary groups or uh, non-state armed actors. Uh, you have different, each Mexican state has its own police force, its own special forces. Then you have the federal forces, uh, 
that some are active in some places and not in others. So, for example, where I did my research, the Marines are not active. So you have this confluence, which is, which is actually very specific to particular locations. And so you really do need to do that uh, field work, extended field work in order to be able to start talking about some of the more specific, how this is actually happening. Um, who are the, who are the, who are the victims? What, what can we tell about them? Uh, who do, what do we know about the perpetrators? How is it being dealt with in the, in the local justice system and, and beyond? Um, and in terms of the systemic nature, I would come back to the state. I mean, I think, um, obviously this is, it's a big term and it means a lot and Mexico has a huge state. So interestingly, that myth of the no state is something that is less common in Mexico and in Mexican scholarship because this, the post revolutionary Mexican state essentially permeates everyday life all the way across the country. Obviously, there's resistance to it and so on, but it's a very strong state uh, in Mexico, but it's, it's the militarization. So really, the deployment of military for forces as the backbone of the violence that is then responded to or in the way that Lena suggested, uh, people protect their own interests, if need be, using weapons because they're forced to do so through this militarization. So I would come back to militarization as being really, for me, the, the main systemic factor. Um, yeah, and, and I think heterogeneity is actually the key word here because um, as a historian, you know, we are very grounded in, in, in specific cases and in specific moments. Uh, that's part of our method. And when we do that with drug history, uh, we see that in each conjuncture, in each turning point, we see a conflict of interest happening, even within a, um, a, a single actor. Like let's talk, for example, about the state, which is in the title of our webinar today, right? The state is not a monolithic homogeneous entity either. And when I was researching, um, you know, that political and diplomatic history behind the marijuana boom in Colombia in the 70s, I realized that there was a tremendous interagency conflict, not only within Colombia, but also within the United States. The most evident one, for example, is the conflict between the DEA and the CIA precisely on what to do with these drug traffickers when the CIA wants to use them, and I'm talking about the 70s and the 80s, wants to use their services and to use their money uh, as part of the cover operations to destabilize those regimes that are seen as a threat in Latin America, while the DEA wants to curb uh, uh, the flow of drugs and to uh, destabilize and destroy their structures. So in the case of Colombia in the 1970s, we see a tremendous tremendous conflict between the DEA and the CIA happening on how to address the problem of the growing trafficking from Colombia to the US. And you go again and uh, you see that again and again in different cases, even within what we call the cartels, which I think is a very inappropriate ter term uh, to talk about uh, the structures that control narco trafficking. But Let's use it because that's the, the easiest uh, to do right now for this conversation. Uh, even the, within the cartels, you see tremendous conflicts of interest as well. And actually, many of the violence that we see in different moments over time had everything to do with those power struggles within the structures that control the trafficking. So we really need to be open to understand this heterogeneity. And the only way to do it is studying case by case in different moments. So we need to have a diachronic perspective and a synchronic perspective at the same time. So that's why field work is so important. But usually we study the, 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 the drug problem as we call it from the policy perspective, right? Um, without studying as a, as a social practice as a, and as a lived experience of the people from below. Uh, so in that sense, we also have an, a built-in inequality in our approaches that are extremely elitist. We only pay attention to the state uh, or, or to the um, drug elites, right? Because when we talk about the cartels, we are talking about, you know, those uh, figures uh, that that figure in the newspapers, no, El Chapo Guzman or Paulo Escobar during its time, but we rarely uh, talk about the majorities of the people who are doing all kinds of menial works to, to support what, this industry. Um, so the systematicity, uh, it comes from 
I don't know, kind of like a, an aggregation of all these different processes and especially a premise that has been put out there as part of the prohibition system in which we live and the paradigm of drug control that, that, that we live. So I think that paradigm really is what give us kind of like a systematicity to the tremendous heterogeneity uh, that, that accounts for, for, for this phenomenon. Fascinating. Um, I, I want to sort of go all the way the other way from, you know, here's, here's the system. Um, I'm going to throw out some four very specific sort of explanations for the root causes that have been put out there in the, in, in, in the narratives that, that we're exposed to. You can pick and choose which one you want to respond to. Um, one is, um, uh, this is all about sort of corruption and corruption of the state. Um, and so what is being corrupted here and and uh, and is that sort of isn't that the root cause of it um second one is um this is really just another form of globalization where we we have drug production and because we restrict it in north america it shifts to latin america and so all we have is a problem of you know basically outsourcing and globalization um, and that's the root cause um uh, third one is um, this is really all about the drugs and the the reactions that we have to drug abuse and the damage that um, drug abuse does on the consumer end. Um, and uh, if it weren't for that, um, you know, if this were any other commodity, it wouldn't result in the same things. And so it's really about um, the the I guess putting the drugs more central in it, and especially the consumption side of it that creates policy responses that are maybe, uh, maybe very different. Actually, I'm going to leave it at three. I, I know that's, that's plenty. So, um, any reactions to that? Um, and again, you know, these are just, you know, questions that came up, uh, but they're also very sort of common narratives about sort of what is really the problem here. Yeah, I'm actually right now teaching a class uh, that is called Making Drugs in the Americas. It's an undergraduate, upper level undergraduate class. And I always start that course every time I teach it with um, what we call uh, in the field colonial history. Because I start, I start understanding uh, this uh, with the history of tobacco and sugar in the 15, 16, 17th centuries. And why I'm talking about this, because of your question about globalization, right? So it's like the, the commerce of uh, stimulants and mind altering plants and substances has been absolutely integral to the history of capitalist development. Um, and, and this has been the work of many historians throughout the 20th century, uh, historians and anthropologists and sociologists as well, uh, who have tried to understand why the uh, commodification of mind altering and psychoactive plans uh, has been integral to this process of capitalist ac accumulation that account for this global world in which we live right now, right? Um, and yes, uh, okay, it has to do with the fact that our drugs, right, that they alter our consciousness, our way of being in the world, uh, that they um, have the potential to be abused and to create addiction. But we see very similar histories of violence, inequality uh, with other commodities uh, that uh, right now we consider legal and perfectly okay. Again, the example of sugar and tobacco, right? Uh, they justify this enslavement of, of African people, right? And like they are bringing them here uh, to uh, abuse them. And, 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 and we know all the rest of the story because we're still dealing with the legacies of that. So what I'm saying is, yes, drugs uh, in particular have a special quality and are involved or like um, um, covered by layers and layers of taboos and fears because of what they do to our minds and our bodies. But at the same time, they behave as when they are commodities, as they are right now, uh, they behave in very similar ways to other commodities. 
Um, and it is precisely that aspect that we need to address and what many people in the policy making community are trying to call our attention to, right? Uh, all these reports that the London School of Economics, uh, the United Nations, the Latin American Commissions on Drugs had been producing in the last 10, 15 years, they all talk about this, about how this is a global history and therefore requires a global response that requires requires state cooperation and coordination, but it also requires to reframe the, the, the frameworks under which we have operated and, and face the taboos that don't let us to speak openly about this uh, in a less hypocritical way. Thank you. Yeah, I would, um, I mean, that's a very interesting question. So I would maybe provoke uh, like a sort of an, a provocative way, I would, I would maybe just add a couple of more potential root causes that I don't think have been thought through to the extent that they should. One is United States wars around the world. Uh, United States is a country that is making war basically since its foundation um, and through much of the 20th century. And so to consider the violence in Colombia and the violence in Mexico as an extension as an application and, and to actually think about US militarism as a root cause. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying, you know, let's also consider that. And another one is the maintenance of neoliberalism. So I think, I mean, what I argue in drug war capitalism is that with Plan Colombia, it was an experiment. Um, the US had not done that type of comprehensive drug war that involved all of the policy changes, that level of economic commitment that many years of uh, military agreements and so on. And I think they came out of it at the end saying, basically, it didn't work in terms of what we thought it was going to do, but it did do some pretty cool stuff, like improve the conditions for certain kinds of investments, improve the conditions for US oil companies operating in Colombia, etc. And so they're also you know, it's useful to neoliberalism. If this, if this type of format of violence and war was not useful, was not, like that's the thing I guess for me is really to think about these wars within the economic system, not as an outlier, not as a separate thing that's happening in a different world where there's no debit cards and everything is briefcases of cash, but it's actually integral part of the working of of capitalism today and specifically to the maintenance of this level of structural inequality that we're talking about. Like what Lena said at the beginning, the reason why Colombians can't rise up and just get rid of these awful governments is because they have effectively armed themselves against any possibility of popular resistance making change. I mean, this sounds very pessimistic and I hope it would be different. Um, but that the drug war and the same is in Mexico has given the pretext for the extreme militarization and paramilitarization, um, which allows them to basically keep a lid on, uh, on, on the potential for popular, popular resistance, emancipatory change, and et cetera. Do you, do you see a, a, a sort of a, a shift in, um, in sort of commitment to to the, the sort of traditional neoliberal project here, where we, we might see a, I don't know, policy changes in the US uh, it globally, locally, where, where, I mean, do you see any evidence of, um, of a, uh, a turn away to different models, um, to different models of, um, of economic governance and, and, and development and, and tends also to the, uh, to the issues of, um, uh, of narco trafficking? I mean, or are we pretty much set um, in in what we <laughs> you know where we I are? I mean, I would say, unfortunately, I think in Colombia and Mexico, no, um, yeah. we're seeing a deepening of, of of these processes of neoliberalism, austerity, and militarization. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I brought up uh, what's happening in Colombia right now, uh, mm -hmm. besides the fact that I'm just very, very, very worried 
uh, um, and very upset uh, about that is because it relates directly with what we're talking about here. Um, the criminalization and militarization as the as the two pillars of this paradigm of governance, right? And with what has happening now in the U.S. in terms of the legalization of cannabis, right? Medi medi medicinal and recreational. Um, it seems like a hope, and in many ways it is. But at the same time, it's happening in a way that that keeps those inequal those built-in inequalities in place. And we see that when a lot of people, for example, who has been sent to jail uh, under those draconian laws against uh, cannabis uh, cons uh, sale, consumption, et cetera, uh, they have been denouncing and they have been organizing uh, to call attention to the need to, to restore justice to the market, to the need to create, right here where I live in Chicago, for example, where uh, cannabis, both medicinal and recreational, uh, has been legal for a little bit more than a year um, since January 2020. Um, there are very important social organizations that are talking about how the, the legal cannabis market is is benefiting those people with capital and connections and those uh, people from like you know uh, working class neighborhoods or neighborhoods who have been criminalized and very much targeted with the war on drugs they don't there are no mechanisms no way to get loans to open a dispensary to participate of this legal economy so once again we see that the even even what is presented as a solution to the problem and i i do believe in legalization and i think that's the way to go regulate and legalize decriminalize regulate legalize but depending on how it happens. And many times it's presented as the overall solution when we are not really examining the details, how is really happening and how those inequalities still persist because still resources, financial, technological, scientific, uh, any kind of resources are being channeled to those privileged sectors that have the connections, um, the, the class background, uh, the education, the access to banks and financial resources, and not to those other sectors of the population that have been systematically targeting by criminalization and militarization. So again, an analysis that is uh, um, case studies, I think is really an important methodology when we are trying to understand drug history and, 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 and drug realities in the present time. Maybe that's a good, uh, it's a good occasion to, that, that there are a number of questions that really concern the, the role of, um, uh, of researchers, journalists, and, and sort of what, what is an, a, a appropriate, but also a, a productive and impactful way um, of engaging with those issues for, um, for university-based researchers, for researchers that are independent, for journalists? Um, but what, what is the role that, that we should all be striving for here? I, I think heterogeneity, again, uh, could be a really interesting principle here because um, I don't believe that we academics should have the monopoly on anything. Um, we just want many voices out there. And our role is actually to make an effort to, you know, come out of our shelf and not be confined to the academic world and, and, and recognize our social responsibility. And our social responsibility implies that we need to be able to talk to general audiences. We need to be able to translate, quote unquote, our jargon and our specialized knowledge to talk to audiences comprised by all kinds of ages, all kinds of class backgrounds. Uh, for example, when I go to Colombia, well, before the pandemic, when I could go to Colombia uh, to talk about my own work, I remember having audiences where there were children practically, you know, like uh, students in junior high and high school, and like really, really older people uh, because I was in a public library 
uh, in the region that used to be the marijuana epicenter and the people who attended the talk were just like the people in the neighborhood. So like, how do you talk to an audience in which your younger person is 11 and the oldest is 75? or 80, right? Uh, but that is our responsibility. And, and to participate more in kind of like those, in those public discourses, uh, be more like public intellectuals and less academics. Uh, and that's a responsibility that is on us. Um, and in that way, uh, like participate in, in, in the creation of um, heterogeneous uh, universe in which all kinds of people are doing all kinds of research. I have friends in Colombia that are that are training um, people who belong to specific social organizations in in doing their own oral history, in doing their own documentary films, in doing their own uh, communications about the realities that affect them. Many times those realities have to do with drug trafficking uh, and drug wars. And young people especially are very much interested in getting the, the knowledge, the tools, the methodologies to engage in that kind of production of knowledge. So I think kind of like this entering uh, and putting an end to the monopoly that we academics believe to have on production of knowledge and recognize that we are just a participant in a more plural um, ways of producing knowledge. Well, it's also interesting that I think both your work um, emphasizes the listening, right, as much as the, the, the it's a conversation that, that, that starts with um, with a, a sort of a deep listening idea, listening in a in a very broad sense, you know, not just um, listening to what the others say, but sort of really understand local conditions and, and engage with people. Um, and I think that's a very very distinguishing approach that that both of you I, I think epitomise. Um, um, I want to make sure that um, we have five minutes left, and I know you had one question too, so. Um, that you wanted to cover, but th th there are a number of questions about. Broadly speaking, so what can we do? Um, what 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 are if you want to use that language interventions that might might be productive? Um, what are sources of change that that could really make a difference here? Um, and so I'm I'm going to pose this as a very open question. Where where do you see opportunities to make to make things better? Um, yeah, that's, I mean, the last question is always the hardest one, right? Um, that's why I leave it to the end. So. <laughs> there are always the questions, the big questions, the questions that are burning for all of us. And I think if we had straightforward answers, we would be living in a different world. Um, I think there's really important solidarity work happening in the United States right now uh, with folks in Mexico on all different levels. Um, from, you know, direct support from people who have migrated, who are sending direct support back to their family members, um, to uh, things like the Brigada Solidaria in New York City, which is fundraising right now uh, in solidarity with family members who are searching for uh, disappeared relatives in Mexico. Um, so definitely, I mean, one thing that I always say in my talks is just think about our own language in terms of how we're talking about the drug war. Um, to, to avoid, you know, saying things like narco state or narco grave or just, you know, the, even the whole the discourse of narco culture, um, which essentially is a way of criminalizing. Again, it's extremely classist and it's a way of saying that there are are it, there exists a category of people which is expendable. Right? So just thinking about our own discourses and and then just the the, the permanent uh, struggle against uh, militarism uh, in the United States and and elsewhere that would be my attempt at a, a response yeah along those same lines um I'm always um because you know I, I I got to this country where when I was an adult already um so uh, my my view and my identity continue to be very Latin American and very Colombian, even though I'm, I'm, I've been here for for a long time. Um, and I'm always surprised to see how invisible Latin America is in in the imaginary, or mainstream imaginary of the United States. Um, 
Mexico figures, uh, just is because it's, it's, it's a giant country just next door and there's so many shared problems. Uh, Cuba sometimes here and there. Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, which actually is part of this country technically, uh, even though in many ways it's not or not considered uh, uh, or dignified in that way. Um, but Latin America is so absent, so invisible, uh, it doesn't really figure in any of the conversations that we have. Um, like in the last round of, of, uh, of, of heated debates that we had in this country that had to do with police brutality and criminalization of social protest, racism, etc. There was a shared history about that with Latin America, but we rarely saw that in the media, either mass media or social media. So my hope, which is at the same time a challenge, uh, is, okay, how can we uh, promote or contribute to a more hemispheric vision and understanding of our problems and talk about the Americas in plural uh, instead of the America as if the America was just the United States. Because from Latin American point of view, when we talk about America, it's the whole hemisphere. But here in the US, you need to use the plural, the Americas, in order to convey that idea. And that says it all. So I think that that one of the hopes and challenges is precisely in um, stimulating and promoting uh, and contributing to that change in our frames uh, to understand the common challenges that we are facing right now and how our histories are completely intertwined because in many ways they are the same history. Uh, with just different manifestations and, and peculiarities and particularities, of course. Um, but, and the same uh, futures, the right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, not just, um, it's not just the past, right? I mean, they, they have to create the future yeah. together too. And the drug business, which is a transnational business by definition, right? Like the commodities are produced in the South, but they are consumed here in the United States, unless we're talking about opioids, which are produced here by pharmaceutical industries. Um, otherwise, they come from the South to the North. The history of this um, of this industry and the cultures attached to this industry uh, is a common history. So I I truly believe that the kind of work that we do, paying attention, centering, uh, you know, uh, drug commodities and the um, structures and societies that account for their production and circulation and consumption, is a really good way to promote that kind of framework of a common shared history of the Americas. I think this is a, a perfect way of ending, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure we, we could um, continue the conversation for, for quite some while and some questions weren't answered. Some I encourage those to reach out to you directly. I'm sure you, you don't mind that. Um, I think it's a great place to end because that's exactly what we at Buffett try to do is, is um, you know, bring those international, transnational, global perspectives to to problems um, um, and foster that that, that perspective. Um, so thank you, thank you very much again, Don and, and Lena, for sharing your time and insights with us today. Um, and thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, our next one will be on May 18th, um, and we'll continue on the theme of inequalities. Um, uh, Emra Yildiz from Northwestern's Department of Anthropology will look at international sanctions uh, in the context of Iran and ask some, uh, an important question of why smart sanctions are just as humane as comprehensive ones. Um, so it's going to be another um, thought-provoking and exciting conversation. And until then, uh, be well, stay healthy, and we'll see you in two weeks.